Welcome to the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Now, here's your host, Associate Editor Mark Dempko. So, hey, everybody, welcome to the Bow Hunting Podcast. Um, we have a very special guest today, um, Shane Indrabo. And uh, I had a chance to meet Shane when I was out hunting in Wisconsin this past fall. His dad owns um, Bluff Country Outfitters in um, what I would call probably the one of the most iconic uh, white-tailed deer hunting counties in the country, uh, Buffalo County. Number of Moon and Crockett, uh, countless open young bucks come out of there over the years, uh, but they have a great operation there. Um, uh, Bluff Country has about 4,000 acres that they either own or lease, uh, offer some incredible deer hunting. We're out for an archery hunt and Shane and I had a chance to talk a couple times, uh, but Shane is involved with the North American Shed Hunter Club. Shane, welcome. Hi, right, good day. Good to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. And uh, when you and I were talking, you, you were sharing some of your passion for shed hunting. Um, and obviously, you know, right now, as we're taping this, the uh, most of the deer seasons in the country have closed. And as you move into spring, that's the big shed hunting season for those who really love to go out and look for uh, the antlers that are dropping off the deer. But uh, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, you obviously have a passion. You're really enthusiastic about shed hunting. How and when did you get started with shed hunting? I got started pretty much uh, when my dad uh, bought his farm in Buffalo County here. Um, I was pretty young. I was probably about I was six, seven years old, something like that. And uh, I just loved getting out there. It was kind of like a little treasure hunt, you know, getting out there looking for in the winter and and uh, just kind of got addicted to it. And my dad and I both did it. He's always been passionate about it, too. And and it just kind of went from there and and became an addiction, really. Yeah. And so, um, you know, where do you do most of your shed hunting? Do you do it right around your home? And and for people who don't know, um, Buffalo County is probably about uh, two hours southeast of Minneapolis, if I'm correct, more give or take. It's in uh, West Central Wisconsin. Yep. So is that where you do most of your shed hunting? Uh, yeah, the majority of it would be on our properties in Buffalo County here. But I do travel all over the country uh, and in Canada each spring and and uh, we go to uh other parts of wisconsin as well minnesota quite a bit uh i do a couple trips to iowa each spring and saskatchewan kansas illinois we go quite a few places but the majority is done at our place in buffalo county here so when you get up to some of those provinces like saskatchewan are you looking primarily for white-tailed deer or are you looking at uh uh do you ever go for moose and things like that? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, every year is different. It depends. I've got a, a couple different friends up there we go with, and uh, uh, there's definitely areas that are strictly whitetails, and then some areas we go that are more mule deer than whitetail, but you can find both. And then in some areas, you can find moose, elk, muleys, whitetails in the same property, which is pretty neat. Yeah. And so, um, you know, when you get out shed hunting, I, I know you live in the uh, upper Midwest, so you probably have a lot of snow on the ground right now. Um, what do you consider the prime time to start shed hunting? I start pretty early, uh, depending on the weather. Um, we run a lot of trail cameras and we wait till some of the bigger deer are off in areas before we go in there so we don't bump them all. Um, but peak around here is usually about right now, uh, mid to late February. And then all of March is about perfect, but we'll, we'll start late Jan, uh, late, uh, December, early January. If, if some deer starts dro dropping early and go into April. Now, uh, at this time of the year, you probably still have a good amount of snow on the ground. So how does that go? Do you have areas that you, uh, focus in on or. Yeah, it's, uh, self facing slopes that the sun hits where it melts first. Uh, the deer spend a lot of time and that's, that's the main, main place we go now. Uh, you know, a lot of the north facing slopes or bedding areas in the woods hold snow pretty late. It's it's hard to find them unless they're right on top. If the snow is frozen and antler on top, it will go. But otherwise, it's pretty hard. Yeah. And um, just curious, you have any guesstimate as to how many antlers you found over the years since you started doing it? Is it are we talking hundreds or you think it's even higher than that? Oh, it's way up higher than that. Yeah, it's definitely thousands. Um, I usually pick up between 50 and 100 each spring just by myself. And do you have pretty good success? I, I know sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll find a one half of the, the spread. Do you have a lot of success finding matches or is that pretty challenging? It's, uh, 
that's completely random every time. Uh, you know, you find them laying right on top of each other like that. And then sometimes they're five miles apart and, uh, every time it's different, every deer is different. And it's really hard to say we, we spend a lot enough, uh, enough time out there that we usually end up finding a majority of them that are on the ground. Uh, but sometimes it takes a couple months to, to match up a set and sometimes you never do find them. So you bring up an interesting point. I get the uh, impression that you're out there quite a bit. Like there are guys who love to bow on and if they could, they'd be out there five or six days a week. How many days do you estimate you're out in the field looking for antlers uh, during the course of the year? Uh, as long as the weather's okay this time of year, I usually, I'm out there probably three or four days a week. And uh, yeah, so you're, so you're really passionate about that and um, you're able to dedicate some time to that. Um, do you have a favorite location that you uh, like to get out and look for antlers? Like you mentioned Iowa earlier, and obviously Iowa's a state that is uh, probably one of the premier states in the country for big bucks right now. And, uh, you know, they uh, have limits as far as uh, the number of non-residents they can hunt or things like that. Did you have any uh, destinations where you really love to go and you look forward to because you know you're probably going to pick up some big sheds? Yeah, Iowa is definitely one of them. Um, we've got some friends in South Central Iowa that have a lot of private ground that, that they let us look on. And and it's it's pretty amazing. We we get a big group of us together and go down there for a long weekend and it's nothing to pick up 200 to 300 sheds in three days down there. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, and uh, you do that, like when, when, when you talk about going out there, is it sort of an, an organized thing? Do you ever have like, uh, uh, you know, usually it's like you do it solo or you have a couple of people like, well, uh, ever any organized opportunities where you try to coordinate a larger group? Yeah. So that, that shed hunt there, it's, uh, it's kind of a invitation thing only he brings some of his good friends down and we'll get 10, 12, 14 guys to go out and kind of look all his properties kind of all at once, once their snow's melted. Uh, but other than that, most other States, I just go, you know, maybe I'll go with a friend or two and, and, uh, we just walk on our own and do our own thing. Now, as your love for shed hunting and searching for antlers grew, you, you got involved with the uh, North American Shed Hunters Club, which is sort of the official um, scoring and record keeping organization for people who love to look for shed antlers. Uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, if, if I'm correct, you're the, the co-owner. Tell me a little bit about that organization, how and where it got its start and where it's at now. Um. It got its start in 1991 in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, it was a Minnesota resident named Jeff LeBaron that started the club, and he was passionate about it. And um, he had recently come across the Minnesota Monarch Sheds that uh, an older man, an older general, had found in northern Minnesota, and they were officially measured, and it was the new world record non-typical. And at the time, there was no way to to officially enter them in anything. And he kind of said, well, this is a perfect time to start and and uh, got it going and got a lot of official Boone Crockett measures on board with him. And, and it just kind of went from there. And uh, he came out with his first book, I believe it was in 1994, the first actual hardcover book came out. And um, it was owned by uh, Tom and Mark Miller. Uh, next, they bought it, I believe it was about 2000, year 2000, 2001, somewhere in there. And they really took it to the next level and and uh, got the name out there and did a lot more shows nationwide and got a lot more people involved. And, and uh, I was official measure. My dad was uh, when they first started. And, and uh, when I got old enough, I became an official measure and I was always involved with it. And the opportunity came up in 2019. Uh, the club was for sale and myself and uh, three of my good friends that are just as passionate about it as myself decided we'd buy it and and see where it goes. And we've been doing it ever since, doing shows. And I'm currently working on the new book. It'll be the, the uh, sixth edition of the record book. And we're hoping to have that out this year. Uh, that's awesome. Do you happen to have uh, any of the books with you? Maybe you can hold one up quick. I do. Yeah, I have uh, the past books here. Uh, these are the the two original books uh, from 1994 and 1998. They were made that Jeff LeBaron produced. And then uh, these are the two books that the, the Miller brothers came out with. 
and we're trying to decide you know we're we're going back to the the, the leather bound kind of coffee table book but we have so many entries now we have over 12,000 to 13,000 entries and the book's going to be at least double the thickness of the past books and you know it's a lot of antlers to have in there and we do all species uh it's not just whitetail any antlered species that sheds and horn species too antelope pronghorn um so anything that drops their antlers we'll measure it and enter it yeah, and and you know, for those who may not be as familiar with the the records for uh, shed hunting, you actually have I think uh, over twelve thousand uh, entries in the books already, right? Yep, and uh, seventeen different categories. Now, do you you do you have separate categories for um, matched antlers? Because a lot of times, you know, you were talking about this earlier. Uh, people find an antler; it's hard to find a matching set. But I'm guessing you have the categories for both, either a uh, single antlers or horns, and then a matching set. Yep. Yeah. There's four categories for each species. If it applies, there's typical single and set and non-typical singles and sets. And um, uh, what's your most popular category? I'm going to guess it's whitetail deer, but. Uh... Yeah, whitetail typical antlers, typical single whitetail antlers are by far the dominant one. And there's. Yeah. Minimum size requirements in each category. So for uh, like a typical whitetail, 60 inches on one side is the minimum to get entered and 70 inches for a non-typical on one side and then double that for, for sets. And how about if somebody's out this year and they happen to say they're in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kansas, and they find a, uh, a match set that's really impressive or they find a single antler, how do they go about locating a uh, uh, a score and starting the process if they want to have it included in the books? Um, they can either go on our website and find a score near them, or they could go to one of the shows that we're at that we're measuring antlers. There's several deer shows each spring, early summer that we do. Uh, the easiest way would be go to our website. Uh, we have a list of by state of all the scores. I think we have 177 scores statewide and in Canada uh, right now. And uh, the website's uh, shedantlers.org. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to mention that next. But uh, yeah, it's a very comprehensive website. And I think that you have listings of the, the top 10 animals and different categories. And you can download official scoring sheets. And as you mentioned, Shane, you can go and find out uh, uh, where you have scores who are close to you. Now, you mentioned some of the shows you visit. I live here on the East Coast. I don't know if you get out this way. But what are some of the big shows that you might appear at where people can have their antler shed scored? Uh, the two main ones we're doing right now are the Iowa Deer Classic in Des Moines, which is the first weekend in March each year. And then we're doing the Illinois Deer Classic the first weekend in April this year. And uh, do a lot of people tend to show up and ask you to check out the antlers they found or get them scored? I'm, I'm assuming, especially in the Midwest, it's pretty popular. Yeah. Yeah. I believe uh, at the, just at the Iowa show last year, we measured uh, 100 and, 167 sheds. Wow. In three that's days. incredible. That's incredible. Um, now, um, what's the best day you've ever had as far as you being out in the field and looking for antlers? You, do you have a day that just stands out to you after all these years that you were like, oh, my gosh, I couldn't believe it? Um, I, I had a trip, uh, I believe it was two years ago in South Central Iowa. We picked up uh, it was myself and a friend. Uh, we picked up 34 antlers before lunch. So it was about, I believe it was two to three hours. We picked up 34 sheds, a lot of big ones. I think we found three sheds over 70 inches that morning. And it was, it was pretty spectacular. Was there something different with your approach that day or did things just work out in your favor? It just worked out. It was, uh, it was kind of their first big melt that they had. And so it was areas that hadn't been, hadn't been touched at all. And it was a lot of good ground that, that, that they were wintering in and, and uh, we just got there at the right time, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And, well, um, you know, I think when you talk about it being a lot of fun, there, it, it is sort of like a treasure hunt, or you could say looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, I haven't got a lot of shed antler, and I found some just in passing. Um, 
happened to find a moose shed the one year when I was up in Canada in an area where there are very few moose. Um, it just worked out that way. As you say, sometimes you just happen upon things. But uh, if somebody's interested in maybe getting into shed antler hunting, what would be the the first couple of things that you recommend for them? Because because obviously you can go out and look for a long time. You may never come across anything. So let's start with like somebody, if they may be a newbie, what do you recommend? Um, I guess the, the biggest thing is you got to figure out where the deer are wintering. Um, you know, every state, every property is different. Um, you know, it depends obviously where, where food is over the winter, if people have standing crops or whatever it might be. But the biggest thing is people look in the wrong spots. They might look where they would hunt the deer in the fall or where they see them in the summer or whatever it is. And, and the deer just aren't spending their time when they're shedding there. So locate where, where their winter source of food is and you'll find antlers. Um, I always start at the food and then kind of move back from there where, where they would stage and then uh, use heavy trails going from those staging areas into their bedding areas and, and uh, just look for a lot of deer sign and find their bedding areas and, and you'll find sheds. And um, so, for example, up by your dad's, you get some areas where you have food plots. I'm guessing those are pretty good in the immediate vicinity around those food plots and when you're looking for sheds. Yep. Yeah. So uh, like standing beans or standing corn, you know, we'll leave patches just for the deer over the winter. So they're not as stressed, especially if we have a really cold winter or a lot of snow. And so we'll start in the beans are my favorite. The the areas around the bean fields where they kind of hang out and stage before they're actually eating seem to be the best kind of grassy hillsides or trick bottoms or things like that. And, um, you know, uh, what if a, a person does do it pretty often, maybe doesn't have a lot of success or they want to up the number of antlers they find? you have any um, uh, tips or strategies for, for people who do have some success with antlers, but they'd like to amass some more? I guess the biggest thing is just put on the miles. Uh, you just got to cover a lot of ground. If, if you know there's deer in the area where you haven't found their sheds, they're, they're there somewhere. So you really got to just cover a lot of ground and, you know, it, it helps if you have a hillside where, you know, there's a lot of sign, you might walk in from one direction and miss them, whether they be behind brush or a tree or something like that. So coming at them at different angles, you know, zigzagging, kind of gritting out pieces, and you'll find a lot of sheds that you've missed. You know, I walk by a lot of them myself, so you really just got to cover the ground and that's about it. You end up combing the areas uh, a couple times, maybe if you know there's a lot of shed, if you know there's a, a good potential for sheds there. Oh yeah, yeah, several times usually. Yeah, and um, now I don't know if you brought any antlers with you, but uh, what's the biggest uh, shed, shed antler or the biggest set you've ever found? Uh, I do have my biggest set ever. It's actually from my dad's place in Buffalo County here off a buck that we called Moses, which is a really well-known deer in the area. And I found his, his five-year-old set of antlers. And that's them. That's um, incredible. And so, since you mentioned Moses, tell us a little bit about that. If I remember that deer to be seven or eight years old, if I remember correctly. He, he was uh, six. So this is his last set of antlers before he was harvested. Ah. It's years old, but uh, it's a deer we were able to follow his whole life. Um, we had trail camera photos and encounters with him from a yearling up until he was shot. Uh, thousands and thousands of trail camera photos. Um, we had several hunters having encounters with him and couldn't get it done. And uh, it was uh, he was a pretty neat buck. He was a homebody. He lived on our farm the entire time, so we were able to pick up every one of his antlers over the years, which was nice. And and uh, he ended up scoring 201 inches when he was harvested. Uh, Pat Reeve actually had hit him that year when he was six years old, early, early season, September of that year, and didn't get him. Uh, that hunt was on video and it looked like a great shot. We thought, thought he was, thought he was dead and he wasn't, uh, he came back. Uh, we had him on trail camera about a month later, he was chasing does and making scrapes and he ended up getting killed gun season that, that year in November. Uh, now, now the the set you just showed us, um, how many points were on that, and what do you think that scored? I'm guessing you have that measured. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, I believe it's 14 points. He actually has five small points broke off, and he still scores 189 inches. And the big yeah. side is 85 and six eighths. 
and this side's 82. But for a match set, that's that's by far my best. Yeah, that, well, that's absolutely incredible. Very, very impressive. Now, I, and if you mention this already, I, I, I apologize, but did you find them both at the the same day? Do you find them different days? Were they pretty close together? What's the story about when you found those? Well, we were running trail cameras that winter, and uh, we had him come into a bean field with both sides on, and he came back about an hour later, bloody pedicles and no antlers on his head. So I got out there that next morning and walked pretty hard. My dad did too. And they really weren't that far from where the camera was, but it was uh, some kind of tall grass with patches of snow and it was really hard to see. And I didn't find them until about five o'clock that afternoon. It was just starting to get dark out. And I spotted the one and I looked for about a half hour before I found the other one, but they were only 50 yards apart. They were just that hard to see. So they were right above the beans in a, a grassy spot on a salt face and slope about 50 yards apart. Yeah. Were you pretty thrilled when you found those? I mean, that's a once in a lifetime find I'm guessing. So, yeah. And yeah. I, that's, that's probably my favorite moment shed on together. And uh, off the cuff, how many years ago was that? You remember? That yeah, was 2005. Yeah. And uh, incredible property your dad has. I think you guys own several hundred acres. And as I mentioned earlier, you you lease a bunch of land. But uh, uh, that deer, as you said, was staying pretty close to home uh, and having some conversations with your dad. He, he said that the, the, a lot of the deer, he, he said, you, I, I forget how many trail cameras he said at one time you were running it was several hundred. And um, you would pick up so many deer on trail cameras, uh, a lot of them that uh, most people would never see. And so uh, it's a pretty elaborate setup. Uh, your dad started um, videoing and running trail cameras way before they were so popular as they are today. Um, he was telling me how he would, um, when the first digital cameras came out, the ones that cost thousands of dollars, he would get them and sort of convert them into trail cameras before we have the uh, much more affordable trail cameras we have today. So uh, you, you guys were really ahead of the curve as far as trying to um, monitor and study and inventory the deer population, especially the bucks out there. Um, so uh, a fascinating story of a, a fascinating property there in west central uh, wisconsin but uh that's an incredible uh shed that you have there oh thank you yeah yeah it's definitely a lot of time yeah it's a it's it's full-time job just running the trail cameras and i think right now we've got around 230 or 240 cameras out and check them every day we use cell cameras now uh so if there's areas we don't want to bother if we've got big ones that are hanging in there we don't want to spook uh, we'll run those and yeah, we, right now, I believe we have over 130 bucks, different bucks on the home farm since yeah, hunting season once we made it. That's absolutely amazing. And I remember when we're out there, I think for like you're talking about the, the wireless or the cellular ones, you'll get the feeds pretty regularly. You know, some people set them and they come in every couple of hours. I think you get them uh, almost instantaneously and uh, it's able to help you uh, monitor when uh, maybe say big bucks might be up during the middle of the day when you least them respect them and things like that. It's a, it's a first class operation that you have out there. Uh, I think your dad said he's been doing it since the uh, the mid nineties, maybe 93, 92, something like that. Um, if you're ever interested in, in, um, hunting world-class whitetails at a world-class establishment, uh, everybody check out, um, bluff country outfitters in, in Buffalo County. Now, um, we're going to shift gears a little bit here. You're talking about your passion for, for, for looking for antlers. And we know that people, um, throughout the whitetail range love to get out there as spring comes and the snow start to melt and things like that. But, uh, um, let's look at the other side of it. Uh, is there any type of market for people who want to um, purchase antlers or is there a market for people who want to um, sell their sheds? And, and first and foremost, I'm going to add in here, it, the laws are going to vary from state to state as far as whether you can sell and or purchase antlers. But, uh, um, you know, can you shed a little light on that as far as uh, the demand for maybe antlers for different products? Yeah, there's there's actually a, a really great demand for it. Um, there's several markets. And like you said, you know, there are some states that you're not allowed to, to buy or sell from, but for the most part, it's okay. Uh, you just have to check with your, you know, state and local laws, but there's a, uh, there's a market for pretty much every kind and every size, every condition of antler. Um, the really big stuff, the collector market, you know, stuff like this, 
uh, there's there's definitely a, a little network of, of people that are really big into collecting the big antlers. I do myself. Uh, I've got a collection of, of world-class sheds. Uh, my other partners that own the club with me own some of the biggest antlers in the world. And, and we take those and tour with them at the show. So we'll have displays of a lot of the state record and world record shed antlers. Uh, you know, the public can come and they can hold them and look at them and take pictures with them and things like that. Uh, when you get down into the the mid range stuff, you know there's a market uh, for rattling antlers, the craft market for making chandeliers, furniture, things like that, lamps, uh, and then um, you get down into people that make uh, the knife handles, uh, you know, little small things, craft market things like that, and then the lesser size or quality antlers go to do dog chews. So there's 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 a market for all of it, and they can bring good money. You know, if you find if you find big antlers, they they are worth good money. So, looking at the high end of the scale, what's the highest price you've ever heard of anybody paying for a set of antlers? And I'm guessing that's going to be a collector who wanted a specific set. Yeah, there's there's been private sales of some of the the world record, the really biggest stuff, and and they can go for a lot of money, but realistically you know there's antlers that that are in the tens of thousands of dollars you know maybe ten to twenty thousand dollars for one side uh and, and they could go up you know double that as a set so you know forty to fifty thousand dollars is is you know it's possible but that's very rare you know that's the upper you know couple percent of antlers ever found so uh realistically somebody could go out there and find an antler that's maybe worth five hundred to a thousand dollars is more of a realistic realistic uh price for something big yeah and and it that's when you think about that is absolutely astounding and, and just like anything there there's there's a certain percentage of people who want to focus on or collect that and so the ones who might be more willing to uh shell out some dollars but uh um you know you were talking about uh world record antlers uh when i was out at your um home uh, I noticed, I think you had some uh, of the biggest whitetails ever taken in, in North America, both um, in the United States and in Canada. Um, but tied into that, I think you had a number of re replicas and you have a replica business. Can you talk a little bit about that and sort of what you do? Uh, yeah, I uh, I don't really make the replicas myself. I do some, but uh, uh, Klaus Lebrecht, uh, Antlers by Klaus, he's molded probably 90% of the biggest whitetails and other species known racks and sheds. And uh, I work with Klaus. Uh, I'm close with him still. And, and I will, uh, I paint uh, the replicas. So I'll hand paint a replica, you know, sometimes with the original there and try to make it exact as possible. Um, I, I've got replicas of most of the world record sheds. Um and like you said, a lot of the racks too, we have mounts of a lot of the famous world record deer that have been taken. Uh, but I also do antler repair, restoration. And, you know, if someone finds a, a big antler that's weathered or, you know, white, that's lost its color, I'll paint it for them and things like that. So you can sort of restore them if they want to put it on display or whatever. Uh, you also do, uh, to go off topic a little bit, you also do... Uh replica fish right uh if i you know, saw some incredible muskies and stuff when i was out there yeah i focus primarily on musky replicas i don't do any actual taxidermy i just do painting of replicas um but yeah that i airbrush a lot of a lot of replica fish yeah now um as far as shed hunting do you have a destination that's on your bucket list is there any place um, that you would still like to get to, whether it's out west to look for elk antlers or say it's Newfoundland to look for moose antlers. I didn't know if you had some place where you're like, I'd really like to get there one day. Uh, that one's hard to say. Uh, I've been to a lot of the, the best places in North America, really. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time out west shed hunting. I, I would like to spend more time maybe going on a you know backpacking trip looking for big mule deer or something like that or like you said even elk too but uh yeah it's i guess that would be one of the areas that i really haven't spent much time but other than that i've, I've shed hunted a lot of the good areas it's the craziest story you have as far as something that happened while you were shed hunting it doesn't have to be your most spectacular day shed hunting but is there something that stands out to you or is this like this incredible day or is like uh if i told this to other people they wouldn't believe me 
Oh, that's hard to say. Uh, I don't know if anything offhand, I guess. Um, uh, I couldn't say on that one. Nothing jumps out at me, I guess. Yeah. Well, um, so, you know, as we wrap up here, I wanted to thank you for joining us. Um, it was exciting to talk with you and see you again. And, uh, you know, if people want to learn more about um, the um, North American Shed Hunters Club, they can go on your website. It's shedantlers.org. And, uh, you know, as we're starting to move out of winter into spring, now's the time to get out there, um, depending where you live. Uh, thank you for sharing the tips for people who want to get started or maybe people who already do it and want to get to a little more focused. But uh, thank you so much for having us on the program and for joining us oh, today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And um, uh, are you going to get out there any more this year now and, and look for you over these coming weeks? Is that part of your big plan? Oh, yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah, we'll be hitting pretty hard here. Well, everybody, if, if you uh, have never tried Shan Honey, now's the time to get out there. And if you have, you know how much fun it can be. So thanks, everybody. And thanks for checking out the Bow Hunting Podcast. Thanks for downloading the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Pick up the latest issue of Peterson's Bow Hunting Magazine on your local newsstand or connect with us online at bowhuntingmag.com.